All right, Mr. Cameron. Okay, I had prepared a first statement, but I have a little bit of comment and a short second statement that I wanted to sort of add as part two. Uh, there was some discussion here about uh, uh, doing an audit on the military, and because I've spent a lot of time on this, basically the way I see it, it's very simple. The military has the power, Congress doesn't. It'd be the same as the f war between the president and Congress who has power. They have the power right now, and I think you have to take it back. They're not going to give it to you. They're not going to surrender and l allow you to audit them because they, they are running the show and that's the way they want it. Uh, a second comment I'd like to make is regarding the same sort of issue about m uh, military. Um, because I was involved in the Area 51 story, I knew George Knapp, who was the chief investigator reporter. He told the story about uh, uh, the Appropriations Committee in Congress had wanted, when they heard the story about the flying saucers at Area 51 and the Aurora and all sorts of uh, planes that were flying around Area 51 that the Appropriations Committee were going like, what is going on here? We haven't heard about this. Did we put money up for this? They sent Dick D'Amato, who was a congressional investigator, to Area 51 to get inside Area 51. He had all the top secret security clearances. He had everything that you needed. He could give people immunity. And he went in there and he talked to the, he tried to talk this one witness that I mentioned to you in the previous panel, this uh, uh, Alfred O'Donnell fellow who refused to talk. And he came back and Stephen Greer can confirm this. He talked to a number of researchers and he told Stephen Greer, just want to let you know you're up against the, vars the, the varsity team of all black budget programs, good luck. Mm -hmm. And he said with top sec security clearance with the appropriations committee behind him, he could not get anywhere, that this thing is so deeply held. And that's basically what Ben Rich said as well, is that it would take an act of God to get this thing out of Congress because it's so deep black. Even though they have the technology, nobody's ever going to see it as far as the military is concerned. Um, and I would also comment on the foreign government thing. I have a little bit of a disagreement with most people because I am from Canada and the idea is that the rest of the world is di di uh, disclosing material. I'd say they are not disclosing material. They are releasing their citing files. Citing files is what the U.S. government released with Blue Book in 1969. Citing, repos citing reports are just garbage. They're just stuff that's there. What you want to see is you want to see the top secret material the interaction between government and military, and it still comes down, if you look at Britain, for example, Britain now, the story is they're bringing out their, their files. They're just dumping their files so they can get out of the UFO business. Margaret Thatcher said, when she was asked in 1997, you must make sure you get the facts correct and you can't tell the people. That's basically the rule around the world. It comes down to military technology, and I think a lot of the governments of the world are basically playing the same game, that they're trying to protect the military stuff and release the, the core story or release the citing files. Um, the little short statement, I'll try to keep it short, the, what I wanted to read was the fact that even though we're looking at a lot of secrecy, there was people inside the Clinton administration who actually did try to get this material out. They were trying to shake this. Uh, Bill Clinton, for example, um, had done some work with John Podesta, um, and they, he, John, he actually, in 2005 in Hong Kong, Bill Clinton actually was ta talking about this in public, and he stated that uh, the vast majority of the people in the Clinton administration believed the story of Area 51. They believed there was a live alien, they believed there was a craft underground, and that Bill Clinton actually went there to try to get to the bottom of this thing. Um, and he stated in 2005, after mentioning this, he said, I'm probably not the first president they kept in the dark or that bureaucrats have tried to wait out. So Clinton tried to get to these, these uh, uh, materials. Um, he told Paul Davids that he was fascinated with the subject of UFOs. And he was very interested in the, the latest Roswell book that had come out that was given to him at that time. And Bill Clinton had actually, as, as we look back in the files, Bill Clinton had actually uh, given a job to Webster Hubble. Uh, in the job he said to Webster, in, according to Webster Hubble's book, Friends in High Places, 1997, Hubble said that Bill told him, if I put you there, over there in justice, I want you to find out the answer to two questions. Number one, are there UFOs? And number two, who killed JFK? So Bill Clinton was a guy who didn't believe the official stories of the UFO or of the JFK stuff, and he actually sent someone to try to get the answers to this material. Um, one, of, one of Bill Clinton's main, this is sort of being overlooked here, one of Bill Clinton's main uh, allies in this, in this effort 
to try to get material, it was John Podesta. And he and John Podesta actually did try to get a lot of classified material out into the public. It, it was the Executive Order 12958, which was signed, signed in 1995, and it introduced the 25-year rule, which hoped to bring to light many hidden secrets inside government like the UFO issue. Uh, what was sought was a proper balance of openness in government versus what Podesta called unthinking secrecy. Podesta stated, our, our founders knew that democracy cannot function in the absence of public information. He noted the importance of balancing the vital interests of national security with the genuine claims of public openness. For two centuries, we have prospered and won in the United States because at our best, we have found a way to do both. So to achieve this, they signed the executive order which said that anything that was over 25 years old had to be declassified except in extreme circumstances. Um, what basically happened was that between 1995 and 2000, the Clinton administration was able to declassify 800 million pages of documents compared to 188 million pages in the previous 15 years. Unfortunately, the sought after UFO documents that the Clintons wanted released with this material never materialized. Um, and then in 2002, Podesta, who went on to work for the Obama administration, uh, stated in a public uh, statement in, in, at, at a sci-fi conference, I think it's time to open the books on the questions that have remained in the dark, on the questions of government investigations of UFOs. We ought to do it because it's right. We ought to do it because the American people can handle the truth, and we ought to do it because it's the law. Uh, another ally in getting openness regarding UFOs inside the Clinton administration was the Secretary of Energy, Bill Richardson, who has made many pro-UFO disclosure messages over the years. For example, writing in a foreword to the book on the Roswell UFO crash when he was governor of New Mexico, Richardson wrote, clearly it would help everybody if the U.S. government disclosed everything it knows. The American people can handle the truth no matter how bizarre or mundane. With full disclosure, our best scientific investigation and our best scientific investigation, we should be able to find out what happened on that fateful day in 1947. Then in a question and answer while he was running for president, Richardson talked about his long history of attempts to get answers on UFOs. I've been in government a long time. I've been in the cabinet. I've been in Congress. And I've also f always felt that the government doesn't tell the truth as much as it should on a lot of issues. When I was in Congress, I said to the Department of Defense, what's the data? What is the data you have? I was told the records were classified. That ticked me off. So I just want to put on the record that there are some people inside government who are actually trying to get the material out. Ms. Howell. I was invited by uh, Mr. Rockefeller to the Wyoming Ranch, along with uh, some of the people here. Stephen Greer was there, others. And what links in my mind was a discussion that I had with then John Mack, MD, psychiatrist from Harvard University, who had taken a great interest in the abduction syndrome, both as a psychiatrist and then as somebody who was trying to understand, as I and others were, what is the true nature of an advanced intelligence that would be interacting with this planet and may not itself, the prime intelligence, be the actor here, but making various kinds of cloned entities that would interact on this particular planet, in this particular atmosphere, this particular gravity, in this particular solar system. And Dr. Mack and I, at Mr. Rockefeller's place in Wyoming, were discussing this, and we went into the issue of why is it that the non-human intelligence, as described in the human abduction syndrome, appears to be 100% telepathic, with the ability to both place impressions in human minds and to also project three-dimensional holograms that the human mind and I cannot distinguish from the world around us. This is something that he, I, and many others had encountered, and the more you, deeper 
you get into this field, the more you realize that our reality can be manipulated through our minds without us being able to tell the difference at times. And this led to a discussion which at the time I had only shared with Dr. Mack, God rest him wherever he is now. That very year, I had a face-to-face -face with a man who was currently working in the United States military who had been aware of my work and by that 92, 93 time period, I had produced the book in Alien Harvest as well as TV productions. And in the whole question of why would something advanced from someplace else in the universe be mutilating animals on this planet, this man was trying to tell me that there is a survival issue as well as a cloning issue in what we are dealing with, and that genetic material has been harvested from this planet for a long time to create containers. And this, in discussion with Dr. Mack, led to, uh, I thought I would share this today to show you, if this is true, what I'm going to share with you, it shows how difficult it is for all humans to relate to any aspect of all of this. The military person was describing his firsthand experience that occurred in 1978 in a small town in northern Arizona. He worked for a unit that would be comparable to what has been in some of the government documents called Moon Dust or Project Pounds. These are units that were put together at least as far back as right after Roswell. Units that would be trained to go to wherever there was a reported crash or landing, because some of these craft have been clearly left or put down. And that their job would be to extract technology, the craft, and the bodies. And that he was on one of those teams. And he told me that in 1978, in this town in northern Arizona, there was a flood, and that our military unit understood that the flood was not caused by nature, and it was not caused by humans, it was caused by something that was in the category of what they called non-human. And that he was assigned to a group to go there to try to understand why had the water been released from a dam into this town by something non-human and that his superior officer said, we are going to communicate with and bring in one of the Ebens. And I want you to have the experience of what a telepathic download upload is. And he said they described exactly what would happen, that his superior officers would be nearby. They had done this before. It was a test and that he was to stand in a particular position and that this non-human entity would be asked to stay on the ground because apparently they have the ability to neutralize gravity even in a focused way as an individual body that they would prefer not to walk on the ground and that one of the conditions would be that the entity would approach him with his full knowledge and that they wanted him to have the experience of the telepathic communication. And I was telling Dr. Mack at Mr. Rockefeller's uh, facility in, in Wyoming that he told me very honestly, he said, you know, I was so full of myself as a young man that when they were trying to warn me that I would not be prepared for what happened, I, I thought nonsense. But he said, it's my superior officer, and he said, I want you to know that there will be a point where you are going to want to run or collapse, and I'm ordering you to stand. And he said, I thought it was so silly. And then everything started to unfold, and the being came about four feet high. He was six foot four. He remembered how much taller he was. 
They had told him the being would come up to about three to four feet from him, but be very low. And they told him, all controlled, that the being would simply raise its head, and when the eyes connected with his eyes, he would no longer be in control of his mind. He thought all of it was nonsense. And then the being's head started to rise, and he said, Linda, imagine having seven feature films with sound, with touch, with heat, with every sensation that we know and more. And over all of the seven films running in your mind are gold three-dimensional symbols. And he said, I remember that my knees began to shake and buckled, and I knew that I was fainting, and men caught him. And he said, they put me on a cot, and they left me there for three hours, and when I woke up, if God himself had asked me what had been communicated in those seven films, I would not know. He said, my superior officer told me later, Every human thinking about extraterrestrial biological entities and the whole issue of us not being alone in the universe and the wonder of being able to travel the universe and to communicate with non-humans, we would like to do it over coffee. And he said, it isn't going to happen. Because what happens when their minds telepathically download to our minds, they are uploading every single thing we've ever experienced or thought from our minds. And that the end result often is information is added by the non-humans into the human mind that has had this experience. But then we live on a planet where our fellow humans cannot even hear what uploaded, downloaded information from non-humans might be because we have taken the position, as odd as it is, that we are alone in the universe and this does not exist. And Dr. Mack, after I told him that story, he looked at me and he said, you know, Linda, I agree, I think we are dealing with extraterrestrial biological entities in some cases. But he said, you know, I think that it's too complex, that it must involve time travelers, other dimensions, and that we are truly like little infants approaching something that is beyond our understanding. And I will just close exactly on that note with another man who died not long after I was able to talk with him somewhere like around 1992. He also served in the military, high ranking. Some people had sought me out because he wanted to ask me a question about some of my work. And I will never forget, he said, Linda, this is all so strange. And it has been so strange to all of us that have been exposed to it for so long that not any of us ever want to take it home to our spouses, our children, or anyone we know. Not because it's threatening necessarily, but because nobody knows how to have the discussion. And today, we are meeting at the National Press Club in Washington where there have been various revolutions before. And it seems to me no matter how strange it is, if we don't get past this point of having our government built on 60 years of lies to protect us, the nation probably will implode. And I think you know what I mean. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Greer. Well, on that note, <laughs> it reminds me of a conversation I had with some people at the 
CIA, and there's a term that's used there, and you'll forgive my vernacular, where much of this subject is referred to as WSFM. Sounds like a radio station. It means weird science and frickin' magic. Uh, and that is the term that's used at the CIA and other places to describe some of this. And, and, and I think that what we have to understand is that if you're dealing with, and, and I do want to go into this because this is part of the, the summary and brief I, I provided uh, for in the Obama briefing and elsewhere. If you're dealing with civilizations, that are 10 to the 6th, the 10 to the 7th years, hundreds of thousands to millions of years, technologically more developed than we are. Every manifestation of their technology would look like magic to us. For example, if you were to go back to the time of Thomas Jefferson and show them an iPhone, uh, or worse, the Salem, Massachusetts, you'd be burned at the stake as a witch, because everything would be absolutely look like magic. So I think that we have to have a certain amount of humility in realizing that when we're dealing with a, a universe that is vast and infinite, uh, that in our own galaxy alone, which has uh, 100 billion star systems, the same number of stars that we have in, uh, as we have neurons in our brain, interestingly, uh, that we're dealing with civilizations uh, just in our own galaxy, which is one of billions, that are able to go through interstellar space. Now, I want to touch on this for a moment because it deals with a little bit that, that Linda referred to in terms of trans-dimensional or other dimensions. And the technologies and the sciences dealing with this subject are what we have termed trans-dimensional interstellar, TDIS. And this refers to very advanced sciences and technologies where there is a nexus between electromagnetism and the magnetic field gravitational forces in three-dimensional space and time, and what Dr. John at Princeton uh, in the engineering lab began to, to, to prove is the science of consciousness, which was actually a, an issue that I did talk a fair amount with, with Lawrence Rockefeller about. Now, a lot of people say, well, this gets into the deep end of the pool very quickly, and in fact, it does. But I think that it's important to understand that if you're dealing with civilizations that have gotten here, and that's what we're dealing with, you're not dealing with something that can go just straight through space at the speed of light even, because the speed of light is too slow. And I remember when I was having a dinner with um, CIA Director Woolsey and his wife, and, and, and actually the really most insightful question came from, from Dr. Woolsey, who at the time was Chief Operating Officer of the National Academy of Sciences. And she said, what I want to know is, how are these civilizations communicating across the vastness of space? Because your cell phone and radio waves are going at the speed of light. And I said, yes, that's just too slow. The speed of light is way too slow. And I, I, had to, to, I, had, I had a gut check. I said, do I tell her the truth and lose all credibility as a scientist and a doctor? Or do I tell her, her something that sounds scientific but that's really not true. And ever since then, I have vowed that if someone is intelligent enough to ask the question, I will provide the answer as truthfully as I can. So I turned to her and I said, well, Dr. Woolsey, it's like this. It turns out thinking is the best way to travel. And the speed of thought is not quantifiable. However, when you start getting into the new physics that have been done, where you have the ability to teleport across vast distances instantly. And this has been done with particles, but we're talking about civilizations that can do it with entire spacecraft and occupants. You're dealing with an entirely new physics. Uh, but their communication devices and their own innate abilities allow for thought-actuated uh, events. And I know Dr. Wood may mention this, and, and it, that he discovered when he was doing some work for uh, <laughs> Old Mag McDonald and McDonald Douglas that, that he looked into some cases where uh, in some meetings with these ETs involved a, a little box, and there was a direct thought communication, but it was also being facilitated through electronics. And this is something that we call technology-assisted consciousness and thought. And this is a very specific area of study that I've really devoted about 22 years to, which may be beyond the scope of this hearing. But I think that in terms of just bringing this issue around, there are so many aspects of it that are very exciting from the point of view of science, technology, and understanding the universe and ourselves. And also, who are we? 
and where did we come from? And how is it that we exist in this cosmos that is a, and I agree with, with Edgar Mitchell on this, that is a conscious quantum hologram that is awake and that we are all part of, and that mind itself is the ultimate final frontier, not space, but consciousness and mind. Now, I know that Lawrence Rockefeller was very interested in these things because I had conversations with him also. Um, but one of the things that, that, that I found when I was working with these folks is that there's a saying in American business, everyone wants to be first to be second. And so in this case, there's so many people who have had an interest in this, but they want to hold back and not speak the whole truth about it. But I think we need to be able to liberate ourselves to speak the truth. And it involves many, many complex issues, part of which has been touched on in the last uh, 15 or 20 minutes. One thing I also want to point out is that if we're being visited by advanced civilizations, and it's our assessment that certainly we are, who is handling that relationship? Do we cede that management to the military industrial complex, and what are the consequences of doing so? Think about this very carefully. I remember doing a, a, a meeting with uh, the Boutrous Ghali family, the UN Secretary General, his wife, Leah Ghali, and we were talking about this, and Leah Ghali turned to me and she said, Dr. Greer, we need you to do this now. We need you to do, I said, I'm a country doctor in North Carolina rattling around in an emergency department. You're the head of the world. She says, no, we can't, it's too dangerous for Boutros, I'm quoting. And then I remember talking to this wonderful senator, Claiborne Pell, who was mentioned earlier, and I was speaking with him, and I, and I would never have gone to college if not for a Pell Grant, because I was very, very, very poor. Grew up in North Carolina, had no resources. Put myself through the last years of high school and college and med school. But, I mean, really poor. And what I, most people don't know that, but what I found when I was talking to, to Senator Pell, who was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, and I was at a meeting with, with Edgar Mitchell and some other folks, and I looked at him, and he, says, and he said, Dr. Greer, I have never been given any information on this, even though I have inquired through any official channels. And I said, yes, sir, what a shame, because you, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, have been denied the responsibility of dealing with the ultimate foreign relations issue, and I pointed to the stars above our heads. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me through those horn rimmed grasses and said, well, you know, Dr. Greer, you may be right. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I am. <laughs> and I said, well, what a shame. So I think this is another dimension. There's the science and technology part of it, but there's the part of it about relationships. And we are not alone in the universe. And we need to have a situation on this planet where our higher nature, our better angels, folks like Senator Pell and others who would approach this in an enlightened way could reach out and form what has begun to be discussed in, in the French government that I referred to earlier in this Ministry of Defense memo to me, a peaceful interplanetary, interstellar diplomatic initiative. And to be honest with you, that's how I first got involved with this, was to establish such an effort, which we are doing as a citizen's diplomatic effort. But in the meanwhile, I got diverted into this morass of the national security state because I felt that our leaders need to know, and more importantly, the public need to know. And we need to then figure out how we're going to advance. And in the, the, the summary I did for uh, the president, there are a number of action points. And one of them is to appoint internationally a high-level committee of folks who could go out and make a peaceful contact that is not militarized, that is not covert, that is not being run by the national security state, but is being done on behalf of all of us, the children of Earth. Okay, um, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony uh, very much. We have a uh, free press, uh, uh, so-called free press. Theoretically, yes. There are advantages and disadvantages of a free press. 
they reported the uh, uh, Boston bombing. There will very likely be copycat things because that was reported. Where the press is controlled, that would not be reported, so there would be no copycat. So there are some disadvantages to a pre free press. Where is the press in all of this? If, in fact, there is a story to be told here, why isn't the press telling that story? Well, I can... Uh, do they seem to be, if there is a cover-up, do they not seem to be complicit in that cover-up? Mm -hmm. Yes. You, uh, well, can I comment on that? I by control really from above. <laughs> who are you, I, I, who are I think asking? this is a really central issue. Um, and I actually, over my 22 years of being deeply involved with this at, a, at various levels, I have concluded that the secrecy is uh, very much involving the fact that on certain issues, we do not have a free press any more than sure. we have a free market economy. And I think that this is a serious problem. Um, and I have a document uh, that will be in the materials that I'll pro I'm providing for the committee that is a 1991 CIA document where it talks about the fact that they have uh, folks at all the major media outlets wire services, news magazines, television networks, to change, alter, or d delay and stop stories that they would like to see stopped. Now, this is, uh, was released briefly and then reclassified. It was under the first President Bush term. And this is not a contested CIA document. What that means is, is that on certain issues, uh, th this will be absolutely, there will be an intervention. And we saw this happen with the 2001 event at this uh, National Press Club uh, uh, disclosure launch uh, 12 years ago almost today on May 9th of, of 2001. And uh, one of the people I, I dealt with, uh, Bob Schwartz, who was on the board of Time Life that uh, later became AOL, Time Warner, and CNN, the whole conglomerate, he told me that he was very good friends with uh, Mike Wallace, and he had given him a lot of these documents that we had, and Mike Wallace has wanted to do this story at 60 Minutes. And uh, the corporate CBS, and I think at the time was, was controlled by uh, Westinghouse, a big defense contractor, did not permit him to do the story. Uh, Ira Rosen, who was at ABC News executive producer uh, for 2020 and Primetime Live, he came to my home in Virginia, out near Thomas Jefferson's home, ironically, uh, and I gave him 35 digital hours of top secret witness testimony and many documents. And he said, this, if true, is the biggest story ever. I want to do this story. I said, well, I'll cooperate fully. Uh, he had gotten his Emmy working with Mike Wallace at 60 Minutes, where he has returned. And I said, I don't think you'll be able to allow to do this story. And, and um, Ira uh, Rosen said, oh, yes, I'm the executive producer of these shows. I can do it. And I said, OK. Well, two weeks later, he called me up. And he said, Dr. Greer, they won't let me do this story. I said, Ira, who are they? And he said, Dr. Greer, you know who they are. Now, I could tell you probably 100 stories like that. And this becomes very worrisome. Here we are in the National Press Club. Uh, and we have a lot of enormously important information. And, and, you know, in the New York Times, if you have three confirmed sources for a controversial story, they can run with it. Here, the Disclosure Project, which I founded uh, some years ago, it was first Project Starlight when I began to work with, with Lawrence Rockefeller. Um, we now have over 500, many of them. Uh, I, I have the names of them, and they can be subpoenaed. Some of them, uh, about 100 of them, we have on digital videotape. Why isn't this a story? And I think that this becomes a very important question in a democracy. Uh, you know, if you have the larger media not covering something that 50, 60 percent of the public believe is true, and there's an enormous amount of, uh, of data, uh, 4,000 landing cases, the Comita report where they documented the landing in Provence of a craft, the Bentwaters case where a craft landed at RAF Bentwaters and left physical trace that has been confirmed by the Ministry of Defense. We have all this hard data and information. We have radar traces of these objects moving. Uh, we have pilot cases. We have over 3,500 pilot reports in our, in our archives. This isn't a story. How can that be? Now there's another reason, the ha-ha factor. I have met with so many senior people in government who say, I am so interested in this, but don't let anyone know that I'm interested. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason for it, I think, you know, you could ha be gay and have five wives and do whatever, I mean, you could do anything and be out of the closet on it, and it would be no problem. But this subject, 
whoa, watch out, because your career is on the line, as mine was. Okay. Now, I think that what you find is that the social opprobrium, the, it's an appropriate term, attached to this issue was launched in 1953. Uh, we have a CIA document that describes their attempts to debunk and ridicule the subject, but also, very important, to engage Disney Studios to make cartoons and movies about it that would marginalize the subject. This is a CIA document, Little Green Men, ha, 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 ha. So that has worked, and there's an Air Force major, uh, a George Filer, who I know, uh, he may be here, who said, look, the secrecy really has been created mainly through the force of just ridicule. People don't want to be made a laughing stock. And I think that fear of ridicule by one's peerage, whether you're a senator or a doctor or a university professor, is a very hard thing to overcome once the counterintelligence people have done their business, and they have on this. And it is propaganda. There is very serious information and intelligence, and I, I think that we have to figure out how do we get around the truth embargo, as, as Steve calls it. In reality, we're sort of in, it, it's not just the government doing the embargo, it's we are doing the embargo because we have been brainwashed to laugh at this issue instead of look at it in a very serious, scientific, in-depth, uh, and honest and truthful way. <laughs> So, time keep. How much more time does uh, Mr. Bartlett have? Three minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I would think that the uh, main reason the press is not covering is covering is a ridicule thing. Yes. We've been watching the tweets on what's going on today. They're not all positive. They're not as negative as we thought they might be, but but they're not not all positive tweets. Uh, Can I certainly. make a comment on this? I want to turn for just a moment. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to comment on this because I've had some involvement with this. Uh, as, you, as I mentioned in my statement, Bill Clinton asked Webster Hubble to go and get uh, the answer to who killed JFK. And if you go to the, the files that have been recovered, there's like 5,000, almost 6,000 pages of, of Kennedy assassination stuff that the Clintons did uncover. And he asked them to uncover JFK and UFOs. When uh, that book was released, Friends in High Places, by Hubble in 1997, that, of course, the very next day in the White House uh, press uh, briefing, that was, question was brought up, and it was Deborah Oren, who was no friend of the, of the uh, Clintons, from the New York Post, who asked the question. She asked uh, the, the President's press secretary, can you tell me, did Webster Hubble get the job to go out and look at UFOs? And he walked around the question the first time, and Deborah Oren, in an interview, said she came back with a follow-up question, and she said, uh, I'd like to know, is what Mr. Hubble writes in his book true? And the press secretary for the president said, I'm not going to comment what people write in their personal books. And Deborah Oren said in an interview later, she said, I sat there and waited for someone to follow up on this very important question, and the rest of the White House press corps rolled over and played dead. And basically what it comes down to is if you if you've, if you're worked your way up to the White House, you don't want to be the one that asks the stupid UFO question. You want to ask something very uh, smart because you may end up losing your job. You worked your way up there. So a lot of it does have to do with the ridicule. And a lot of it has to do with, I mentioned Chase Brandon, who was this 42 years CIA guy. He writes a, a fictional book about Roswell. And there was one of the stories that we'd always tried to track in the UFO world, and that was by Richard Helms. It was a statement where Richard Helms says, we control all the media of any consequence in America. And we were trying to track this. And if you look in Chase Brandon's book, his character in the book actually uses this statement. Jesse Helms said, we control all media of any consequence in America. And the character says, I wish he hadn't said that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Senator Gravel. Can you come to any other conclusion as a body that uh, our nation is essentially ruled by a military junta? Can you come to any other conclusion based upon all the statements that have been made? Well, I think, yeah, I think it's not just military. I think it's a large macroeconomic and financial system. So it's the military, industrial, corporate, financial complex. And I'm not against corporations. However, as Jefferson said, the unchecked power of a corporation. 
uh, and, and see if, if our budget is $3.8 trillion, but we're talking about something that if it's disclosed would threaten the privately owned interest in the oil, gas, coal, utility industries that are estimated in the multi-hundred trillions of dollars, what tail is wagging the dog of our democracy? And that's the big question. Let me add to that, I came across a study two years ago in uh, Switzerland, uh, Zurich, where uh, an institute uh, studied the interlocking directorates, yes. 43,000 corporations. They winnowed it down to uh, 1,350 corporations. And these are interlocking directorates, interlocking uh, family ties, and, uh, the, and primarily the top 10 were banks, international banks, and uh, they own 60% of the wealth of the world. Correct. You're aware of that? I'm, I, yes, I'm very aware of that study, yes. Congresswoman Kilpatrick. Thank you. This has been an absolutely awesome day. The professional, the professional testimony that we've heard, awesome. Everything that you've said here, this congressperson knows it to be true from things that we've done in our own lives. President and the military is always a friction there. Governors and their state and military or police troops, it's a little friction. Mayors and their police force, it's a little something there, who has the power? I think that's an inherent something that our world witnesses, and I certainly have over my 60 plus years of life. I think it's important that we work with the foreign governments. There's been 10 or 15 already identified who have acknowledged this existence. I wanna be a part of that. I wanna go, I wanna see, I wanna all of that. And I'm, I'm presenting myself for that because I wanna do that. The public-private partnerships that I mentioned earlier today got to do it. Once upon a time, this country had horse and buggies. We moved to cars. And then now it's moving to something else. There were no emails and computers and all of that if you, ten, two decades ago. I mean, evolving. When you talk about oil, gas, and coal, yeah, that's the money. And it's about money and power. But who's to say you can't transition that to what we're talking about here today with the kind of partnerships that we have to build in order to do that. So we phase out of oil, gas, and coal, and we're doing it already, but we're just not. I don't think this issue is now that I've sat here all day is separate from, and I'm sure I'll know more about this by the Friday. But I think we have to look at it in terms of a comprehensive something that's related rather than separate from. The things that you all have testified today, and I know them to be true. I don't even know people who, are, who have had this. And, in the last month since they found out I'm on it, I get all kind of things from around the world. <laughs> happy you're gonna be listening. And I'm happy that I am listening. But I want us to consider who that public-private doctor, for example, Dr. Greer. Excellent information, all of that. Gotta be funded. I do money, that's what I've done in my career. I don't have any, but I mean, that's where I work. <laughs> that's where I worked. But, but we can do this. I mean, we, we can do that with a pro if we broaden our scope. It's not us and they, or them and us, it's right. us. Yeah. Right. Or there's nothing. Right. I, I, you know, I think it's that important, and I don't have the answer for it now. I just know that there's something here that we've touched on, at least in my little experience in these eight hours. It's something to build on, and I want us to consider that. The military industrial financial complex is real. It's, it's real. I mean, and everyone knows it. It's real. It's a real entity, and it really directs our world in the various countries. I can't speak for them. I can speak for U.S., and it's real. Not to be thrown stones at, but to work with. And I think when we bring them in as partners, because actually the complex has more uh, power than the president, I'm sorry, I hate to just put that on record, the president, I, not the person, but the office is what I speak. That when we deal with it as, again, a, as a whole thing and not us over here and them over there, we can do this, Stephen. It's just going to take, I think, an international coalition that would help, someone just said it, help bring us to where we want to go to do some of the things we need to do. And then, finally for me, the Military Intelligence Committee, we have to have that, and it exists. And we've always thought that it helps us do a lot of things, like Boston most recently, and as big as Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and all. I've been all over the world in this job of mine, but I haven't in this capacity. I'm offering myself for that. I, I, I see that we can get to this, 
This was a brilliant way to start it, Stephen, and, and build on what you guys have already done for these last 50 plus years. Uh, this is the 21st century. The 20th century is over. It's about coalitions and partnerships, and it's an international one that'll save our world and our country. So uh, uh, to the, all of you there, you know, not, you know, I always say the woman, she brings a whole other perspective here, thank you, without notes and all of that. If you harm God's animals, and something does from time to time, as you just described, in a way that we know nothing of, or there's no blood or other liquid fluids, that, that's something that's, I, see, I believe, too, and I'm going to end on this. I don't have a question. I'm making my final statement of the day. Of, <laughs> if, you, if you talk about everything we've talked about today, and this is just day one, I can't even imagine what we're going to do the rest of the week. <laughs> but the hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, winds, I'm a biblical person. I believe it's biblical. I believe that everything that's going on, what we're talking about now, and the power that might be out there that we, they are scared it's going to overtake us. It won't overtake us because we're going to work with it. We're going to build a partnership. And, and the sooner that we get it done, the safer our children will be, the more protected our seniors will be who built these great countries. And the international connection is what we must do. So for all of you today who've come before us and become for me specifically, I just want to say thank you. It's not the big end, it's just the beginning. Thank you very much. Congressman Cook. I do want to say that uh, I've been most interested in your references to Bill Richardson. Now, I may not be a member of their party. I may be a member of a party that's uh, opposed them on many, many things, but I have never known a more intelligent and honest and uh, deeply committed members of, of the government uh, members of the administrations and, many, and Congress and everything else, as they, and in cabinet positions that, that I think they held, plus we're almost going to be holding. So, um, I, and I've been deeply impressed, as I've known, even before today, before what you said, Stephen, that uh, these people have been particularly prominent in wanting to end what you called the truth embargo. So. Uh, certainly, uh, Richardson has made statements that, uh, that he says, hey, definitely, just to have somebody of his stature say that something landed in Roswell, and we need to have those files. The reason I'm putting that background to this question is because I can already tell, especially from our luncheon discussion as, as, as former members of the Congress, that. Uh, there seems to be developing a consensus that whatever we think of the evidence at this point, we think there needs to be hearings and there needs to be official hearings. Again, I'm, I'm impressed that uh, the attorney, I forget his name right now, that's been Daniel working. Sheen, Daniel Sheehan. Yes, that although he called for UN <laughs> hearings initially, he kind of was talking as, as his last statement that we need congressional hearings. Now, I don't know whether folk, whether this group, this panel, should be focusing on members of the Congress to do something or members of the administration to do something. And I also, and, or maybe both, oh, I shouldn't use the expression rats chasing rats, but maybe that's not such a bad <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's bad a little example. bit, but you know, here, here's the nice thing uh, about the new media. We have a world now where we can stream. Uh, the Huffington yeah, Post, that's what I was gonna okay, the Huffington Post did an article about the film Sirius that's, that's just been released that, that's based on our work. Uh, it had uh, like four million people look at it. Um, I think that we can do a lot that we couldn't have done 12 years ago, five years ago with the new media and the people's media. That's one thing. The other is that I, I want to put out a call for other witnesses from inside the military, intelligence, and corporate world to come forward, but who will come forward rank, serial number, name, actionable intelligence. One thing I want to comment on, there is a confusion that's been in the room a little bit today between access and control. Now, I just want to say that I have been able to provide actionable intelligence to where there would be access but you don't necessarily have control. 
And I think we have to understand the difference for the President and for even some of these senior military officials that I've met with and continue to meet with, there is a, a huge problem there. And this is something that does need to be fixed. Uh, the media is one part, the public is one part. I think we have to get all these components going. But something that needs to be looked at from a constitutional and national security point of view is that you cannot have information like this being withheld from the commander in chief and senior people like the Defense Intelligence Agency head or the CIA director, which we know is going on. And I think that if we cannot fix that, our democracy is in danger, but so is our world. Thank you. Okay, our cleanup batter is uh, Congresswoman Hooley. Well, I'm going to follow up on the question, uh, our, what you just said, uh, Mr. Greer, and that is, you talk about access, talk about control. How do we, all of us, change that around so that the president feels in control or the person that heads up an agency feels in control. Give me some of your suggestions. Well, you know, one of the most poignant things that happened some years ago when I was wrapping up my almost three hour meeting with the CIA director was that I gave him uh, something very much like this that has a bunch of, of recommendations for executive action, uh -huh. executive orders. And he looked at me squarely in the eyes and he said, Dr. Greer, how do we disclose that which we don't have control over? And I said, you get control over it. Now, you have to, I hate to use the term, lean into it and lean into it hard. I mean, the powers of the Congress and the powers of the presidency and the courts are substantial. And I think that if they are then denied access control over projects that, that we can prove are going on, that there should be serious consequences to that, because that is treason. And I think that the other uh, point is that the public have to demand this level of transparency, which are, uh, and, and then ultimately, there ha ha needs to be a, a, a level of compassion for those who are trapped in a system that they are terrified to take on. And, and I think that this is why there has to also be a level of protection for people who want to step forward, who are deep insiders. I mean, I would love to give a list of, of names of folks that I have met with in very high and deep positions, but they've asked me not to. I recently put on YouTube the testimony of a man who had worked with the CIA who would not let me release it until he died. And it's up there now, Powlett, go look at it. I think that it deals with something you'll hear about later, implants, which were actually developed by the CIA in the 70s and 80s. My point is, is that we have to also understand that many of these men and women who come forward are enormously courageous, but there are many others who would like to, but they can't just do it in some kind of a circus. They also have to be assured of their protection and their safety. And I can address the whole intimidation issue from something that happened. People are so afraid for their lives, their families, because they have had to sign non-disclosure agreements in which they basically are told, if you say anything to anyone, your family will suffer because you will not only be put in prison, but all benefits will be denied your family. I've talked with several people who have signed such disclosure agreements that are working on some capacity in the extraterrestrial issue. And this really came home to me, uh, probably this was back around uh, 1985, 86. Um, a security guard at Lockheed Martin in the facility in Denver had uh, approached me because she had read my book, my first book, An Alien Harvest. And she had asked for an autograph at some place where I was speaking, and she volunteered. She said, if you need any help with anything, I'll help you. And she began to do some filing and various things. And she was uh, very, I guess you would say, she, was, she felt that An Alien Harvest was a book that should be out there in the world. And one day she told me she had a friend working inside of Lockheed Martin in a position that was related to something that they were doing in aerospace, but it was classified. It was one of those office complexes where you had to have 
the need to know in order to enter or the red and the blue lights right. would spin. And she invited him as a friend to uh, go out to dinner or something. And he said, why don't you come over for, we're having a birthday party next weekend. So this is somebody who has a confidential position and now she's going to the house and she said, I just thought your book would be the most perfect gift. And she said, I presented <coughs> your book and he took it and he looked at it and he spun through the pages as if he already knew and he dropped it on the floor and said, take this from this house, put it in your car, and don't ever talk with me about this again. And she was shocked because she didn't know that the classified area must have had something very intimately to do with the subjects in an alien harvest, which was about animal mutilations, extraterrestrials, law enforcement and medical research in something that the government denies. And that is happening in so many ways where people become so intimidated that they will not even accept a book. I think I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is uh, the close of day one. We have four more days. And I want to compliment uh, all of you out there in the audience, I guess your audience, I mean, your participants as far as I can tell, and you stayed all day, and I hope you're here all the way through Friday because uh, you're, you are amazing, and our uh, witnesses have been great. We'd like to ask for your input. Share your opinion and expertise with us in the comments after watching the video. If you're a subscriber, you'll always get a heart from us as a small thank you, and we'll pin your important post to the top where everyone will read it first. Just make sure you've already subscribed, like the video, and mention both at the beginning of your comment.